All right, it's uh, three o'clock. So welcome to the Swedish NLP seminar. My name is Magnus Olgren and I will be the moderator here today. Uh, this is a seminar series that we organize here from AI Sweden with uh, support from RISE, so the Natural Language Processing Group from, from RISE. Um, and we run this as a hybrid seminar, so you can join us either here at the AI Sweden Stockholm office uh, or online. And today we also have speakers joining from both here, uh, at the office and online. And we also have a physical space in Gothenburg that you can join if you happen to be in Gothenburg. Um, if you are here in Stockholm, you can also have the opportunity to spend the day here and co-work, which many of you do. And we greatly appreciate that to have the opportunity to interact with, with all of you. Um, if you have followed this seminar series, you would have realized that we tend to focus on language models a lot. And today is no exception. Today we're going to talk about the use of la large language models in the news media sector. And we have presentations, we have actually four uh, presenters from two different organizations covering the basic uh, news media landscape here in the Nordic region. So first we will have presentations from Shipstedt, who will join us here. Uh, and this will be Björn and Thomas from Shipstedt. Uh, and then we will go online and have presentations from Hans and Magnus from Bonnier. And uh, so I think that we covered the entire landscape. It will be really interesting to hear about this. I think that's it. Uh, I'll come back towards the end with the uh, program for, for the seminar going forward. But please, Bjorn and Thomas, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks a lot to AI Sweden for the invitation to join the seminar series. Um, we are going to talk a little bit today about uh, generating news summaries without hallucinations. So our experience with um, large language models in generation of news summaries in, in the newsroom. And I want to start just giving you a brief overview of what uh, Shipstead is. Um, so Shipstead started actually in, in 1839. Uh, as, a, as a news publisher, with um, Afton Boston being the first, um, first news outlet um, and is now a uh, company of uh, over 60 um, brands and um, about 6,000 uh, employees. Um, so we have uh, lots of the biggest uh, marketplaces in the Nordics, um, big news media, um, uh, outlets, Aftenbladet and SVD here in Sweden, VG and Aftenposten in uh, Norway, um, and also um, growth and investment companies. And so who are we? We are data scientists that are working together with a Shipset wide uh, unit that is called AI enablement. Um, and we have a variety of different things that we are involved in. Um, we're supporting AI use cases across the organization if different parts of the organization need help. Um, we're involved in an upscaling um, uh, program related to AI. Uh, so we are upscaling employees that um, would like to participate in this program. Uh, we're building common AI frameworks and we also have uh, research collaborations with, uh, with academia. And so I just wanted to give um, a couple of examples of where we are in, in Shipstead using NLP. Um, I'm not going to go in depth into those because our focus today will be on, on new summaries. Um, but just uh, to give you a flavor of things that, that Shipstead is also doing in NLP, um, one thing is contextual advertising. That means um, if you are a company that wants to sell bikes and wants to put ads, um, uh, to the to the relevant uh, news media news media pages, um, you might want to put that next to articles that are contextually relevant to your to what you're selling. So um, there it's basically something where you don't have to take user behavior, user history or cookies into account. You can directly match on what is the the content of this article and does it does that fit the particular ad what you want to sell. 
Uh, another case is speech to text. Um, there, developers from from VG have um, uh, developed a, um, a UI, basically an interface to uh, to OpenAI's Whisper model, um, uh, and that is used in uh, podcast transcription and in interviews transcription, um, and and in other cases, um, making it easy for for the journalists to have access to that technology. Uh, and as a final point. Uh, text to speech there um, the Norwegian newspaper uh, Aften Boston has developed together with an external company uh, a, a customized speech um, that they are providing for for many of their articles so you can listen to to the articles um, and just to set a little bit the context here um, there is, uh, we all know that there have, has been a lot of NLP progress in recent years, in the past five, six years especially. And um, many things go back to this, to one of these um, early papers so in, in mid 2017. This is one of the f foundational papers for, for the transformer architecture. Um, for example, then you have, I mean, there's a lot missing on the slide, of course, there are a lot of uh, parts there in between, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here, uh, where Instruct GPT came out uh, in the beginning of 2022. And I think the, the models there, um, the next generation of, of those Instruct GPT models in uh, the middle of 2022 actually um, had already capacities that are, you know, relatively similar to chat GPT. But um, I would argue that it was particularly ChatGPT and the ability for the public to have an interface to these models um, that um, where things, uh, large language models and um, NLP in particular, I think um, the public gained a much better awareness of that. So uh, I would argue that with all those, with all this technological progress of the last couple of years in NLP, and the um, increasing public awareness, we are kind of in a situation where there's a, a fertile ground for uh, using actually NLP in a variety of different projects. And so one of the questions there is um, how well do, do these models perform? And I think it's, it's in general quite a difficult question to answer when you're talking about generational uh, or generative models like like GPT. Um, so we made an attempt here. Um, we have uh, just submitted a, a manuscript uh, for publication together with our colleagues Agnes Steenbaum and Emil Svensson, um, where we are used we, where we used a custom fine tuned GPT three model. So it's a slightly older model, but it's fine tuned on two thousand four hundred um, uh, summary or article summary pairs. Um, to generate new summaries. And we let uh, around 30 journalists across Chipset news outlets uh, evaluate the quality of those uh, generated summaries versus journalist written summaries uh, in a blind fashion. And so the results, um, uh, so, so we evaluated this on a, on a couple of different dimensions. One of them is, does the summary include the key facts from the article? Is the summary grammatically correct? Is the summary fair? And in all of those, um, it seems to be the case that um, there isn't a big difference between um, how the journalists evaluate the uh, AI-generated summaries and how they evaluate the uh, journalist-written summaries if they don't know uh, what is what of the two. Uh, here, another slide that, that shows that shows uh, quality scores, quality ratings that have been given by the journalists to, to these summaries. Um, and I think this then um, uh, encourages us to, to see, uh, you know, is this something that can be used in, in practice? And VG, uh, the, the Norwegian uh, newspaper, has um, has um, actually implemented this in a, in a very short time into production and what they're using now is uh, GPT-4 behind the scenes and the idea there was um, is it possible to reach a, a younger audience um, if you present them with the possibility to get a, a short version of an article 
um, at the beginning of the article. So they implemented this button that you can see here uh, on the slide. And that basically will summarize or give you a short version of, of the corresponding article. And the way that, that this is implemented right now is that um, the, the journalists are basically generating a summary like this in, in their um, creation tool. Um, they evaluate whether that is a reasonable summary and edit it accordingly, and then they will publish it. So there's always a, a human in the loop. I think that's important to emphasize that will check the quality of these summaries. And so the initial uh, tests, initial feedback that we got from, from the users or that VG got from the, from the users uh, seems to be very positive and encouraging. So I think it's, uh, it's definitely something that um, will be tried out more uh, on more articles and, and rolled out further. Um, but it's also important, I think, to think about, um, we know that these models, these generative models in general, um, hallucinate quite a bit, that they come up with facts that um, in this case, in this particular case, they might put facts in the summary that don't appear in the original news article. So that's, uh, of course, especially in the newsroom, a very important uh, thing to avoid. So this is this will be uh, relevant for, for the second part of this talk, um, where Tom will show you what our attempts were to, to mitigate this problem. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, that's what I'll be talking about. Um, but if we just take a step back and think about more generally the, the issue of hallucinations in uh, text generation from large language models. So it's a sort of notorious uh, aspect of, of these models. Um, you know, they're often uh, very fluent and convincing, uh, but at the same time, they are frequently, you know, reasonably often incorrect, make little, little boo-boos in, in terms of um, factual errors and whatnot. Um, and uh, if we think about why this is the case, um, there was a very influential paper from a few, few years back that, um, that sort of um, investigated this issue. And, uh, and they say an LM system, LM is a system for ha haphazardly stitching together sequences of linguistic forms. It is observed in the past, uh, in the vast training data, according to probabilistic information about how they combine, but without any reference to meaning. So it's basically, a, as they put it, a kind of a stochastic parrot. And that's, uh, kind of the key issue there. Um, and it's still a major problem um, and, uh, and unresolved, um, although um, with some of more um, recent developments, um, yeah, specifically this um, fine tuning and reinforcement um, learning from human feedback that then enables this sort of instruct models and chat, chat GPT kind of models, um, those uh, sort of steer and, and uh, control the, the output um, in a very effective way, but it doesn't really, um, you could you could argue it doesn't really address the the issue of reasoning or, or meaning um, but in our particular case we're talking about here we have um, a special situation because we have um, the summary that we've generated and we have the source article that that information um, comes from um, and so we can we can cross check the summary in practice against the source article and that kind of somewhat, somewhat gets us towards this um, aspect of um, reference to meaning, because we, we at least want it to have the same meaning as the source article had. So it's a little bit of a, of a different situation to just sort of blurting out um, text about something. Um, and so then this is, it's just a, a classic, you can, you can view it then as a classification task. You've got your summary and your source article, and you want to say, um, does the summary contain a hallucination? Yes or no? Um, and when you put it in those terms, um, then um, there are several different approaches that you could take towards this. Um, you could have a um, supervised um, training, sort of standard supervised training approach with example uh, pairs of uh, summary and article and then the annotation, whether it has hallucination. Um, you could take a, a few shot classification approach with uh, the GPT-4 and whatnot with, with prompting. You could you could try some kind of um, approach with um, semantic similarity of of, um, of summaries versus um, article um, sentences, um, or you could try you take a zero shot approach. Um, and we have actually investigated um, these last two options, uh, but I'll just uh, sort of go over some of the pros and cons of each. Um, well, firstly, though, um, we have this um, this data set um, consisting of um, 
279 um, annotated uh, summaries uh, where the, the annotation has been provided by Elena and Lasse from the Futures Lab um, in Shipstead. And uh, what they've done is, is gone through and, and struck out um, text um, for uh, where, they, where they think there's a hallucination um, in a summary given the, the corresponding source article. Uh, and um, we, we, we split that into trend validation. We, we did it in a, a little bit of a, an unusual sort of split compared to what you'd normally do. Normally you'd have more training, but that's because our training here um, actually um, mostly ended up consisting of a whole bunch of uh, prompt testing out different prompts. So it's a bit, bit of a different sort of uh, setup to, to normal thing, but that's our data set. Um, and uh, yeah, then you, just to ponder the supervised approach, um, there, there are some, some merits to this. I mean, there's some, um, some clearly very performant multilingual pre-trained uh, models such as uh, Roberta XLM. Um, uh, and uh, so there's, there's some, some good uh, pre-trained models to start from. Um, but, uh, you know, the data set that we have currently, it's a little bit small, um, even for, you know, for fine tuning um, with, with that. Uh, you, um, you've got this issue with the token limit for those models that is, is really too restrictive. Uh, but then maybe, oh, there could be some other multilingual long former model. We looked at that a little bit, maybe worth investigating a bit more at some point. Um, there is also, um, um, yeah, yeah, there's uh, also the option of, you know, open AI, their models uh, do have long windows so and they have this embedding option. So you could actually maybe um, have a, a classifier on top of that, something like that. Um, so maybe worth revisiting this option where more data um, is available. Um, but um, yeah, another approach is a few shot via prompting. So, you know, you provide like several, several um, so, um, summary article pairs with the, the output, whether it contains a hallucination or not, and just provide several examples and then, uh, and then provide your, uh, uh, your summary and article of interest and then ask it to provide, you know, complete the prompt kind of thing. Um, and uh, we previously sort of ruled this out due to the, the token limit, um, even for the these, um, you know, GPT um, 3.5 and whatnot. Um, it was bigger, it still wasn't enough, but uh, you could maybe reconsider this now, but we haven't looked at that yet. Um, but this is one thing we have looked at is this um, sort of using semantic similarity to sort of um, flag as, as a way to sort of flag um, uh, potential hallucinations. So um, what you do is you would embed um, each of the summary sentences and each of the article sentences. And then for each of the summary sentences, you find the closest article sentence. Um, and then the overall score for the summary is the distance for the, the worst scoring summary sentence. And this is a sort of little GIF visualize, visualizing that here, where you've got the summary on the left-hand side and the article on the right-hand side. And you can see as you hover over um, the given sentence, it'll, it'll sort of highlight um, according to the, the color, the, the closest uh, sentence on the right hand side to give you a flavor of how that could work. And uh, anyway, we, we tested that approach uh, with that data set I mentioned, and it kind of worked okay. I mean, it, it, that's the ROC plot for that. Um, um, yeah, so uh, then moving on to zero shot approach, um, which is just, so what you do here is you, you just have a prompt like, is the following summary accurate given this article? And you just have your prompt and then ask it to you know respond to that and um by it uh we tried but i mean like gpt4 and uh, instruct gpt specifically a text da vinci 003 model um those ones we uh, we mainly focused on and we sort of discovered this useful trick that you can use to to get a quantitative score out of it because um you know obviously um that's a bit of a drawback of just you know you ask it to just give you a yes or no um, response and you, know, you get this text out of it. And that's you know that's that's something. But what if you want to sort of increase or decrease the stringency? Well, what you could do um, is um, use these two arguments in the OpenAI API. We found you could have this logit bias where you restrict it to only saying yes or no by having giving those two a high bias. And then uh, with your um, you also use this log probs um, arguments to ask to get the the log probs the log of the probabilities back. Uh, for those tokens. And uh, that way you get the actual scores for yes or no, and you can use that as a basis to um, to get a, a single sort of quantitative score. Unfortunately though, um, that argument is only available for InstructGPT and not GPT-4. So um, we couldn't get that um, 
to, you know, we couldn't use that in the case of GPT-4. Um, but we, we attempted to sort of get the best of both worlds by um, by combining um, the two scores. So this, this is the, the score in the end. And, and the idea here is that it basically it'll, if, if GPT-4, if it says, uh, look, there's a hallucination, then it'll trust that. Otherwise, it'll go to this uh, sort of fall back on using this quantitative score it gets from Instruct GPT. And these are the results uh, for those approaches. Um, on the left-hand side, it's the head-to-head -head comparison here. So we've got the, the blue line here is the performance for Instruct GPT, um, where you sort of, um, you um, let in, whoops, um, you let in more and more um, sort of false positives, but you um, also get, um, identify more as you, as you go up to this curve. And you can see here um, with GPT-4, we just get a single point because we don't, we can't vary the threshold, uh, but it does perform very well at that single point. So you'd like to get the best, best of both worlds. So we um, just use that, that score that I showed to get this, um, this ensemble of those, and that's how it does. Um, so yeah, GPT-4 performs very well, um, but you can't vary the threshold. You can combine it to make it more stringent. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it would be really nice if, if you had that log props rubber. Um, but that sort of highlights the, the drawback of this API access thing. You know, you can't, if you want to do anything just slightly outside of a standard thing, then you, you know, it's, it, it's not the same as if you had the model yourself and you had the weights and you could, you know, and com you completely rule out something like using the gradients to sort of visualize, um, you know, what the, the key tokens were or something like that. So um, that's the frustration of um, the API, I would say but it's at the same time very convenient. So pros and cons. Um, so uh, yeah, um, our current approach is, uh, yeah, this zero shot approach with these two combined. Um, and you know, it's nice and easy to implement, uh, two API calls to open AI. Um, and um, we could achieve like a recall of 84% with a false positive rate of 32%. And that seems kind of high, but um, you know, you could, the thing is you, it, the false positives are sort of cheap, you know, because you can just, uh, you know, have another go, you know, and that's what we do actually. We just sort of, the idea is we generate um, another summary if it's no good and then try it a bunch of times, maybe like five times and, and give up or something. Um, but um, yeah, that's, um, that's the approach. Um, and uh, the idea is that this should provide an extra safety mechanism um, in case, um, you know, otherwise you, uh, you could easily sort of miss the, there's a hallucination if you're manually reviewing it, that could happen. Um, so it provides an extra safety mechanism um, and also saves manual effort. Um, so um, next steps. Um, so um, it seems uh, from the discussions we've had so far or how this is going is that actually maybe the hallucination issue is not so much of an issue right now because we have this crucial manual step um, and it's not as though like the, the rate is combined with this uh, this extra help, it should be maybe maybe acceptable now with that manual review. So maybe the focus now turns to other things. Like for instance, could you flag if a summary is too boring? Um, and actually, um, a master's student, um, Celine, who is here today, um, is investigating um, these kind of questions in a more broad, sort of comprehensive manner in the futures lab. Uh, so. Broader future directions. Um, so I'll just sort of briefly speculate on that. Um, so it's pretty clear that new interfaces are going to be more and more important to consuming the news. It seems like a fair fair bet that something like chat would be, you know, chat interfaces to the news could be something that that becomes more common. Um, other new interfaces, perhaps. And there's also this trend with the the modalities um, converting. I mean, Bjorn mentioned two examples of that earlier. Um, that um, the Chipstead has um, has um, implemented, um, and that could be more sort of widespread, you know, just converting, but what, between for whatever's convenient for the the person consuming the the news, and then um, you've got um, you know transforming a style, um, the length of it, or the tone, or the language it's in, or whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, so in summary, uh, it's pretty clear that these methods um, are now good enough that they're probably quite useful in, in several different ways um, to, to media brands. Um, and um, nevertheless, there are some technical challenges that um, need to be overcome to, to um, really roll it out in a, in a good way. Um, so we'd like to thank our wonderful colleagues who uh, we had the pleasure of working together on this stuff. Um, and um, 
thank you for listening. And also AI enablement is hiring. So um, if you're interested in that, um, then come and speak to us afterwards. And uh, yeah, yeah, happy to take questions. So thanks. Yeah, we're going to wait with the questions. So we'll save oh, them and then yep. we'll come back to them. Thanks Tom and Bjorn for a really great presentation. And then we're going to immediately go to Bonnier <laughs> to see what they're up to. So I guess we'll uh, let Hans uh, have the floor. Great. Yes, I think you can see my screen now, correct? Yes. yes. Excellent. So my name is Hans Jan and I am the product owner of the data science team at Bonnier News. And we will talk today about how we use large language models today and some plans for the future. And now I will let Magnus introduce himself. Yes, uh, my name is Magnus Engström and I work as head of architecture and data also at Bonnier News, uh, of course. And I think I have the first couple of slides, so Thank you, Hans. So first of all, Bonnie News, uh, this is a very round number, of course, but we have around 3 million digital active users, mostly in Sweden, makes us the largest publisher uh, in Sweden right now. If you go to the next slide, these are the majority of the brands that those 3 million users are distributed over. So, and, and I guess there are some familiar brands in this, hope, hopefully. <laughs> um, and we have uh, a lot of to talk about and a lot of things to uh, show you uh, in hope of generating a discussion. So we are just gonna keep moving on. Uh, and if you have questions about Bonny News as a corporation uh, or the publishing brands, then of course we can also answer those questions after the presentation. But as for presenting Bonnie News, I think this is the only slide we're going to get. So let's keep moving. <laughs> right. And uh, I will take the first part of the presentation, which is focusing on the way we use large language models currently. So this is the data science team at Bonnie News. Like I said, I am the product owner. And then we have four data scientists. Emma, Erik, Maria, and Lucas in the team. Uh, this is our team's mission statements. And I have uh, circled two words here, create value. So this, this is how we focus our work. And uh, one point in showing this is to say that we are not a research lab, we are, we are not focused on R&D, but our focus is to create value for the organization. And um, how we do that just quickly is summarized in these kind of strategy points. Um, as Magnus said, we have a lot of brands. I don't, is it about 150 maybe um, in the organization? and we support them all and try to create value for all of them. We're a relatively small team, so one focus for the team is to build scalable solutions. And what I mean with that is we need a lot of automation and um, because what, I mean, the team is responsible for the whole uh, so to speak, production chain. So we're starting by basically collecting data training models, uh, deploying them in the cloud, um, monitoring them, retraining them when it's needed. So uh, uh, that's why we have that the focus on scalability. Um, we are a central team in a large organization, so we need to take an active part in informing ourselves about the needs of all the parts of the organization. Uh, we have also constructed a, a set of ethical guidelines to, to guide our development, both in uh, around things like how we do analysis, but also, of course, how we do model development and 
how we work with AI. So that's the background uh, for the team. And uh, of course, the topic today is large language models. And I will show two examples of how we use them in production today. And then Magnus will uh, talk about our plans for the future. The first example I will talk about uh, is text classification. Um, at Borneo News, we have uh, what we call a topic tree. So basically a, a hierarchy of topics. Initially, this was based on the IPTC standard, but now it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, it has about 2,500 topics today organized in this hierarchical uh, manner. Um, so so uh, our kind of the version zero of the, of the text classifier was uh, built on a large language model, but then uh, as I said, because we have this focus on scalability and uh, automation, we said, okay, but do we really need that complexity in our production environment? Uh, won't, uh, isn't it better to choose a simpler model and then um, we get most of the value from that? So actually our version one was built on support vector machines. Uh, but then as we started to uh, do more experiments and uh, compare the quality of the output we saw that okay it's actually worse well uh, it it's worth it for us to switch over to using uh, a system based on BERT uh, so switching over to the large language model just because the quality of the output was that much better so um here is an example I, I don't expect you to be able to read this necessarily but it's an article that comes into the system and the article uh, talks about how Sweden and Finland is applying for NATO uh, membership status. And uh, of course the article gets tokenized and fed into BERT where BERT can do its um, classification based on, on the tokens. And what you see to the right is, of course, the tokenized text, but it's also um, showing the result of sending the text through Google's Lit tool, which stands for Language Interpretability Tool. So the idea there is that um, given a specific text and a specific class that the classifier has predicted, uh, it will show you uh, what tokens were most important in classifying the text as belonging to that class. So it's a bit hard to see, but some of the words here are colored and some are have a deeper color than others. So that's one way of kind of understanding both for kind of um, debugging the system, but just to get a general understanding of what's going on under the hood. And of course, you're all familiar with the uh, text classifiers from your uh, mail clients, where the task is to have the system answer, is it spam or is it something else, something useful? Uh, in our case, uh, since we have so many classes, uh, currently our system can uh, identify about 1,000 of the 2,500 topics so it's actually 1000 decisions happening under the hood for each text it has to classify mm. <clears throat> and uh, just like uh, the presenters from shipstead mentioned uh, this has now enabled us to um, when an advertiser wants to show advert advertisements on our platform, uh, they can now um, decide to show those ads on particular topics. And here is a snapshot from uh, last fall, uh, where you can see what was popular back then. 
And for those of you who speak Swedish, I have actually a question for you. Can anyone uh, make a guess as to when this snapshot was taken? And what I mean is when, what kind of real world event was taking place when this snapshot was taken? And I'll give you five seconds to make a guess. <laughs> Did we have a guess? There was a spectacular murder of some type. A spectacular murder? <laughs> spectacular murder. Uh, <laughs> Election. Election. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, that's that's the one. So, uh, oh, okay, the, the Swedish election was taking place, and here you can see the most popular topic was crime, law and order, kind of, and the next most popular was climate and the environment and private economy. So you, you could see how these topics would be popular during the election, I guess. Uh, yeah. So now it's possible because. Like I said, we have all these uh, uh, brands, and now it's possible to reach uh, readers across the whole network, thanks to this uh, classification. And we also integrated uh, this into our CMS. So whenever a journalist writes an article, uh, the system will generate suggestions. In the lower right corner, you see a couple of suggestions for topics. And if the journalist likes those suggestions, it can just click on the plus button and add them to the metadata for that article. And quickly, the second example is from named entity recognition. And for that, we are also using a, a model um, based on KB Lab, uh, the, the Swedish BERT. And what we try to do is, of course, identify entities in the text, but also uh, do some level of disambiguation if you have several entities with the same or very similar names. So the first step here was to build a dashboard for evaluation. So we have a column here called name entity recognition entity, and then the column next to it is where we try to link it to some uh, entity on Wikipedia or on Wikidata. And our idea here was, so this is an example of an article from our CMS uh, about a hockey game between Team Roa and Lexand. And here you can see that the journalist has tagged this with Team Roa Eco, which is one of the teams. But the, the hope here is that there are actually uh, many more entities in, mentioned in the text. So if we could help the journalist by suggesting these entities, uh, we could get a much richer metadata in the end. And like I said, so the, the column here with the entities is populated. And then the next step is to go from, so if we look at Lexan, for example, if we just search that on Wikipedia, we get a lot of different entities that we could be talking about. But of course, in this case, it is the sports club. And we have a, a basic um, machine learning system that scores these as well. Uh, yeah, that was a quick overview of a couple of examples of large language models currently in use. And then I will had, uh, hand it over to Magnus to talk about the future plans. Uh, thank you, Hans. So um, we can move directly into the next slide. So what I would, would like to talk about now is looking uh, ahead in the future. I mean, we already saw some great examples from Shibstedt about how this type of generative large language modules already put into action. And what I figured was that since I saw the agenda, we're not going to talk so much about summarization uh, in those uh, the, the following slides, since I figured that we would have great examples from Shibstedt. Uh, so what I would like to focus on, firstly, talk very shortly about um, the image that we, see, that we see on screen right now, that we have a publisher and we have a user. And then between the publisher and the user, we, we have some kind of interface. That's the UX, the user experience. And I think the hard part when thinking about AI in the future and looking at publishers and the business models of publishers 
is trying to decide where AI will have most of an effect. If you go into the next slide. So if we don't do anything, if you don't start applying more smart solutions and start applying that this kind of uh, technology, we might end up in a situation where the AI is mostly, uh, mostly on the user side. Uh, more, for example, uh, maybe we have a machine learning model that actually acts, acts as an agent for the user that collects data and presents content for the user in whatever interface the user prefer. So in this case, the, the consumer of the publisher is uh, the AI and not the end user. And so if you don't do anything, this might be where we will end up. Yes, that we will see less and less real users, so to speak, and more and more AI users that acts on the behalf of the end user and adapts to whatever interface the user is preferring. Another way to approach this, if you go into the next slide, is trying to apply as much of the technology as possible on the other end or the other side of this UX line, saying that we try to apply smartness and we try to uh, make uh, uh, the new services adaptable and uh, making it possible for users to configure their experience more and more and being getting more and more technology in place that actually learns what the user would like to see and how the user will interact with our products and so on. So this is kind of the, one of the main challenges challenges we see with AI as, as of now, that we kind of need to understand where on this interaction line AI uh, will have the biggest disruption and how much we should start to rely on those types of technology on our end to avoid ending up in a situation where there are several abstraction layers between the publisher and the end user. So next slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, I have a couple of slides here that I'm not going to talk too much about. We heard mentioned earlier that uh, the language models are basically stochastic parrots. I think that's a great term. <laughs> and um, what, what they're doing basically is to, uh, predicting one word at a time. So to write good prompts and trying to work with the interface that we do have towards those models, as mentioned before, we, we can't really do much about the parameters and the weights and so on. So what we need to do is trying to understand in the first step how to good, do good prompting towards the models. And one thing to keep in mind is they, they are predicting one word at a time and um, have a very instinct um, um, structure for how to connect words together. If you go to the next slide. And also, um, one thing when looking deeper into the models is there are neurons in the networks that acts if in, in certain contexts and certain words and so on. And what happens is, if you go to the next slide, uh, I, I figured that the slides we're going to now, I, I wanted them to be here in this presentation, but I guess we're going to try to share the material after the presentation, then you can go back and look at those images if you'd like to. So but basically what happens is that the, the network and uh, the neurons in networks actually point the models in a direction. So we say that this is our prompt and the prompt says, tells the models to start predicting words. And this is in this is the direction that we like this um, model to act and start predicting words. And with that in mind, if you go into the next slide, um, if we're gonna look at uh, uh, publishers, we could say that we have different types of information connected to community events and social happenings and changes in society and so on. And all of, the, all of that is information and, and also uh, very deeply connected to context. So publishing news is to process this information in a journalistic direction. So that is a, a kind of how we look at prompting a large language model. If you go to the next slide. So we figure that if we I'm going to talk about uh, publishing and media and the use of large language models. We should probably end with just showing different types of examples of uh, the model being put to use. And uh, we don't have any uh, checks for hallucinations in place for those examples. I don't think there are any 
um, is that it's not diverging too much from what it's supposed to do, but this, this, we can just look at this as examples, things that we are currently looking into at Bonnie News on how to apply these type of models. So I'm just going to go through this. There's a lot of text, so I'm going to talk about what the model is actually doing and not maybe read the text out loud because then we're going to be here forever. Next slide. So one example is this is uh, just giving a news article to the model and saying that we want to generate headlines. And if you just say that the model should generate headlines, then we're gonna then we get a lot of headlines that are practically unusable. It becomes much better if you also say that the headline should be listed and uh, suited for different target groups and different channels, because then the model will also write the reasoning behind the format, how the headline is formatted. And this makes it a little bit easier for us to understand kind of where to dig deeper and how the model reasons when creating the headlines, for example. And also, we might actually use this as a tool to get different headlines depending on where the article is is published and which channels we are marketing the article in. Uh, next slide. Um, this is um, an example for example on when we have an article that talks about um, quarterly report for uh, the industrial com um, uh, company Sandvik. And what we're saying here is that I'm Stefan Wieding, that's the CEO of Sandvik. Um, and I would like to be interviewed based on this article. Also, uh, to kind of keep hallucination at a low, we need to add some things to the prompt. For example, we need to say specifically that the model should act object objectively and uh, don't say that anything is good or bad. Otherwise, when I answer a question, the model will often respond with, that's great to hear, for example, and then it's kind of take then we are out of context for what we're trying to achieve here. So next slide. So in this case, I'm not going to read the questions and answers, but this looks uh, pretty reasonable. It's also pretty good at asking follow-up questions and so on. So this is just an example of doing an interview based on information, previous information. Uh, next slide. Um, another example is uh, to use unstructured data. This is uh, events from a hockey game. I think this is the final in the uh, Hockey Allsvenskan in uh, one of the games in Hockey Allsvenskan. And I just basically found a website where I copied all uh, the match, uh, the, the game events, and just posted them, unstru this unstructured data into the prompt and, and told the model to write a report of this game. If you go to the next slide, it does a very good job. Uh, it's it's not actually not too much hallucination in this if we're going to read through it. We don't have time for that right now. But this is a very good representation of the unstructured data that I gave the model in the prompt. However, this is not very, this doesn't really look like a news article. So if you're going to the next slide, uh, we can ask for summarization. And now it starts to get a little bit problem because we have a lot of things in this that I don't like, for example, triumphs is a very large word to use in a headline. And if you look at the very last, in the last uh, sentence, the nail biting match was a true showcase of skill, passion, and determination from both teams. Uh, unforgettable experience. I mean, this doesn't really <laughs> cut it for a news article. Uh, it's not very objective. Uh, so, um, what we need to do here is that we need to try to kind of tone this down a little bit. So we can go to the next slide. What we can do is that we can ask for a more dry version of this article. Uh, and also, just for the fun of it, we can also uh, add some light speculations and how the team might go forward with the roosters and into the next season. And of course, this is very hard to fact check. Since we, we're, we, we're asking the model to hallucinate. We're asking for speculations and so on. But it does a pretty decent job of uh, um, producing something that actually looks like something that could be published. Um, next slide. All right, and finally, um, we can try to do a lot of the things that is happening during uh, the production chain of articles at once. So in this uh, case, I'm saying that my name is Magnus Engström and I work for Placeholder News. Uh, I will write an article in Swedish and I want the JSON data 
back for that article. I want the categories to be mapped to the IPTC standard. Uh, and I only want the JSON data, nothing else. Um, and I also want the model just to say ready for input when if it understands these uh, instructions. So if you go into the next slide, what happens is that the model says that it's ready for input and I only post the article data, nothing else. This is the article copied from Expressen, I think. Uh, and finally, on the next slide, what we get back is a JSON structure that looks pretty much as all JSON structure looks for Bonnie News, complete with the correct uh, uh, IPTC categories. I actually double check to see if those categories were correct and th those are real category indexes and points towards categories that is very relevant for this article. So I, I figured that this was, uh, or refigured that this was a good way to kind of end this presentation part of the seminar because I, Hopefully, this will arise some questions in the discussion part going forward.